we will see that there are still some other subclasses of SAT which can be solved efficiently. So, at least one of them we will discuss. So, that concerns the Horn formulas. Horn was a logician A Horn. So, in his name it is given Horn formulas. We might think of a Horn formula as a CNF where the clutches are of some special form. So, the special form is uh, that in a disjunctive class at most one literal or a variable is unnegated, all others are negated. Okay. For example, if you take a uh, single propositional variable P, it is a Horn class. Okay. If you take not Q for example, that is also a Horn class, there is at most one which is unnegated. If you take something say not P 1 and not P 100 and not P 3, that is also a Horn class. Okay. But you do not have and there, it will be Horn formula where each of them is considered as a Horn class. Right. If you take R of them, that is also a Horn class, there is nothing unnegated there, everything is negated. But you can add at most one, that is still a Horn class, right. But if you take another which is unnegated, this is not a Horn class. Okay. So, a Horn formula will be a conjunction of Horn clauses. Right. Each Horn class is a disjunctive class here, where at most one is unnegated, all others should be negated. But usually we do not represent Horn formulas in this form, because there is a more suggestive way of writing them. For example, P we can write as uh, top implies P. Is that right? They are equivalent. And this not Q we may write as Q implies bottom. Okay. So, that means we are using top and bottom symbols here, though we do not use them in the usual CNFs. So, they are also taken here. So, that means we have to define a Horn class in a way that top and bottom are also included, but then we will be sticking to this one instead of the disjunctive form. What about this one? And for a Horn class, we will not have two unnegated variables there. So, let us have one. Now, in general we can write it as because of De Morgan's, it will be not P 1 and P 100 and P 3 or P 2. Okay. And then that is equivalent to P 1 and P 100 and P 3 implies P 2. So, this will be the general form of a Horn class. You have ants of propositional variables without the negation sign, then implication sign, then another propositional variable. Right? But in general, we want top and bottom also, so we do not stick to propositional variables. We say they can be top and bottom also. Right? So, it is a proposition of the form P1 and P2 and Pm, or say Q1 and Q2 and Qm implies Q. In general, it will be looking like. Q m implies Q, where Q 1, Q 2, Q m, Q have no negation symbols. Right? They are either propositional variables or top and bottom, that is atomic propositions. So, everywhere you are allowed to use atomic propositions, but suppose you have a top symbol here, then it does not matter, you can just forget it, because top and everything else will be that one, top is gone. Suppose you have bottom here then everything will become bottom equivalent to right. So, then bottom implies Q. So, they will be of these three forms and this is the general form where those two particular forms are also allowed. Okay. Other things that is top on the left side is here, if you take top on the right side that is valid. So, you do not have to worry about it. Right. Suppose you write Q implies top that is always valid always true, take any interpretation that will be true. 
because top is always evaluated as 1, right? anything implies 1 is evaluated 1 again. So, that is valid, we do not have to write it. Similarly, if I say bottom implies q, that is also valid, because once antecedent of a, an implication is false, total is true. So, we do not have to worry about those two forms. Then it will be specially in these three forms. Is that clear? So, once you know what a horn clause is, then you take a horn formula as a set of these horn clauses. Instead of again putting an and symbol, conjunction of those, we just take a set of horn formulas, right? Or horn clauses. So, a horn formula is a set of horn clauses. Where horn clauses are of these forms. Is that okay? So, a set of means they will be interpreted as ands as earlier. Okay? For example, we take one say P or say top implies P. Say top implies Q. this is considered as a horn formula. If you write it as a CNF, then it will be ants of their equivalences. right? So, that will look like this one will be equivalent to P and this is equivalent to Q, this is equivalent to R, this is equivalent to not Q or T, this is equivalent to not U or V this is equivalent to not p or not u or not s. Okay? So, this is the CNF which is written in the horn form as above. Right? Now, for this horn formulas, you can have an algorithm which will be easier, which will give you the results easily. So, the result is either the horn formula is satisfiable or it is not satisfiable, that is what we are interested in. Fine. Now, how do you say whether this is satisfiable or unsatisfiable? How do you proceed? Well, our procedure says we want to find one interpretation which is a model of this. If we do not find any, then it is unsatisfiable. Now, how to construct one interpretation which could become a model of this Hahn formula? So, we start looking at these types of horn clauses, because once it is top implies p in order that the whole thing is evaluated as 1, p must be evaluated as 1. Okay? Correspondingly, if you look at the CNF, if this becomes 1, then each of their clauses should become 1. Right? So, this says assign p to 1, we start constructing one interpretation. So, say i is the interpretation we would like to put i of p is as 1. Right? Next, looking at this, we would say i of q should be 1. Next, looking at the other one, we would take i of r as 1. Fine. Now, q is already assigned to 1 and q implies t is 1. So, t has to be assigned to 1. So, next we put i of t as 1, then u implies v, there is no u till now assigned. Okay? You can assign any way we like, does not matter. So, either p uh, i of u is 1, i of v is 1 or any other way of putting at it, whenever it becomes 1. We cannot take certainly i of u equal to 1, i of v equal to 0 only that we cannot take, all the others we can take. Right? So, for the time being we do not worry about it, we will see later what happens. 
Now, what about this? In order that we make this to be 1, the left side should be assigned to 0, right. So, p should be, huh. so the total thing has to be 0. Now, at least one of them has to be 0. Which one is free till now? P is assigned, u and s have not been assigned. So, one of them can be assigned to be 0, right. So, let us say i of u is 0. then automatically we will revisit v has to be 0, because u implies v is 1. Okay? So, in that case we have to take i of v as 0, there is no other way. Yeah? Hmm? V? Okay? So, you are free still, if v is 0 then u has to be taken 0, because total is 1. But if u is 0, it does not give any assignment to v, it does not determine it, it can be 0, it can be 1 also, right. So, let us keep both the possibilities. Okay. Now, remains s, s can be anything also, does not matter. So, again you have two possibilities. Okay. But now, whatever way you take out of this four, there will be four cases here given. Okay, you find that the whole Horn formula is satisfied. Okay, is it clear? But then always you need not find out one interpretation or a model of the Horn formula, because all that you have done, once you see such a formula, you mark that. That means it is to be assigned as one. Fine. So, you again mark this, you again mark this. Now, q implies t, q has been marked, so t has to be marked, there is no way. So, t is also 1, that is what we have done, mark it. Next, what to do? u implies v, u has not been marked. Okay? So, you forget it with that rule. See, the rule is once the left side is marked here in such a class, the right one has to be marked, that is, it has to be assigned 1. But if the left side has not been assigned, we do not worry about the right side. So, for the time being we forget it. Next we find this, here what happens? If all of them have been marked, then only it is, it will has to be marked to be 0, but we cannot mark, mark means you are assigning it to 1. So, once all of these have been assigned to 1, whatever interpretation you take, this has to be assigned 0, right. So, this will be assigned to 0, total formula that is it will be unsatisfiable. If you, but if you find that some of them are marked, some of them are not marked, then all those things which are not marked can be assigned to 0, in order that it is satisfiable. Hmm? So, in that case we do not need to assign, we just say if all of them have been marked, then report that it is unsatisfiable. If all of them have not been marked, then it is satisfiable. We do not have to really find one interpretation there, that is what it is telling. So, there can be many possibilities here how it can be marked, so that it will be evaluated to 1. Is that clear? So, these are the observations you employ in writing an algorithm for determining the satisfiability of Horn formulas. So, first thing is you look for all these classes, assign all those variables or mark them. Okay? Then you look for one class which is in this general form, let us say. Okay? Now, in this general form, you say if all of this q 1 to q m have been marked, then mark q, right. Okay. So, this has to be done recursively, again you may have to revisit and mark others depending on this, because one marking here can change another earlier visited one, which you have omitted. So, once you omit that means you take to the end of the list, like this one u implies v you could not mark it at that instant after marking all these three. So, you just push it to the end of the list, right. That means, all those have to be revisited, before it they have been visited. Now, once it is at the end of the list, it will take its own turn if necessary. Now, you look for these types of things, if already all of them have been marked, then mark q, then continue to the next 
if something is cannot be marked here, then push it to the end of the list. Now, continue along with. So, once you get one formula of this type, one clause of this type and you find that all of them have been marked, then you report that it is unsatisfiable. If you do not find and still you are at the end of the list and there are some which you could not mark, then it is satisfiable. Is it clear? Assigning to 1, assigning it to 1. So, once you are not marking it means it can be considered letter. No, it can be considered letter. Right? which says that there is not a unique way of assigning it. There can be many ways of assigning it. No, marked means always assigned to 1. No, no. That is why we are pushing them to the end. Is it clear? Okay. For example, here I could have put u 0 v 0, okay. but if u is 1, v has to be 1, that is what it says. Fine, but I could not assign to u, so I push it to the end. There are three possibilities there, in which way it can be uh, assigned to 1. So, I do not consider it now, let me wait. So, I do the other things, might be other things will fix u, but I find that at the end it is not fixing u. So, there is a possibility of marking it, that means assigning it to 1. In fact, there is always a way to assign it to 1. So, I do not go for marking it, I just declare that it is satisfiable. Is that right? So, it is really a partial interpretation we are doing by this marking algorithm. We do not have to construct, we would not have to give all these details. These are all the possibilities we can be which can be done, but anyway, there is a way to mark it, so that everything becomes one. So, once there is a way, I am not worried, it is satisfiable, I declare at that time. Is it clear? It will save some time, that is all, instead of assigning always to one, instead of exploring the other possibilities. In fact, there lies the efficiency of the algorithm, because by such things, it can become exponential. You have to search one or non-deterministically assign to one. So, that non-deterministic assignment, we are not going to do. Fine. Wherever it can be fixed, fixed it, and wherever it cannot be fixed and cannot be contradicted, right? Leave them. That is satisfiable. Is it clear? Yes. Yes. Suppose that is one. Here you have uh, P has been marked. Okay. U has not been marked. S has not been marked. Suppose you had two other clauses of this one. Okay. Right. Now, what do you do? While marking P is marked, Q is marked, R is marked, since Q is marked, T is marked, now then U is marked, since U is marked, V is marked, S is marked. Right. So, now you see P, U, S have been marked, therefore, it is unsatisfiable. If bottom is not there, yeah. a new variable is there new variable is there, then it is always satisfiable, because once all of these have been marked to be 1, that can be marked to be 1, in order that it will be satisfiable. So, do not worry, is it clear? So, Horn clauses can be solved efficiently, Horn formulas in fact. Right? In fact, this helps us in the sense that most of the application problems that come, that fall into this category. Horn formulas by chance. So, we are happy because of that, but still there remains many which are not. So, that there we really need efficient algorithms for SAT. We will discuss one such algorithm which performs better in most cases, but not in the worst case. Worst case again will become exponential as of now, right. We will see such method later, maybe after some time, but we will take a distraction here to see that there is one nice application of uh, normal form conversion, CNF and DNF conversion. It concerns about our calculations. We can show that the calculation method itself can be employed to validate the consequences. 
we have seen that it can be. So, what is the big deal? The big deal is suppose I ask you any consequence to be proved. Question is can you have a calculational method to show that yes, it is valid? What is the guarantee? Hmm? What we do in calculation is we start with the premises, then try to go towards the conclusion, right? Using some laws. What is the guarantee that always you will be able to do that? You will end it there if it is valid, right? Huh? Is the question clear? Well, we can make it somewhat mechanical. Suppose we have sigma enters W, that is the consequence. Now, sigma is a finite set, let us say. Now, in that case, instead of starting towards W, I can just put not W inside sigma and use reductio ad absurdum. So, I have only one target which is bottom to reach that makes something mechanical, right. I do not have to search in the wild where to get this W, I just have to find bottom that makes it easier. Okay. Now, question is suppose you start with sigma union dot W not W and you know that it will it is unsatisfiable. What is the guarantee that a calculation is there which will end in bottom? It is unsatisfiable that we know. Now, using the laws what we know or whatever we have developed till now, what is the guarantee that you will always be able to end with one bottom? Do you understand the question? Question to be understood first. Huh? Then we will understand why it is a big deal. The question is this you have to prove sigma enters W. You know semantically that this is correct, right? Sigma in fact enters W semantically. Now, what we have done is we try to build another set sigma union not W. Okay? We say that this is equivalent to deriving bottom from it. This is just theorem, redux word absurdum, right? this happens if and only if this also happens. Now, we have a target to go towards bottom. So, we start our calculation. So, in the calculation we use premises from sigma possibly not w also. Right? Finally, we want bottom to come and we have some limited number of laws to be used. Now, what is the guarantee that always you will have a calculation using those laws to end at bottom? Understood the question now? This is what we want, we want a guarantee. Otherwise, we will not have faith on calculation. We will say sometimes calculation will succeed, sometimes we do not know what will happen. Is that okay? See, in many maths problems, some theory has been done, then we will give you assignments, okay, solve these problems. Now, you know some methods. What is the guarantee that whatever method you have learnt will give you an answer? That set of question we are asking here. Is it clear? I can give something which is from advanced thing, which will not be able to explain through all those methods you have learnt till now. Okay? Teacher can trick you that way, because he knows something more. Now, you want to say that he does not know anything more, even if he knows it is enough to show that within these methods we will be able to reach bottom. Right? So, that issue is called completeness of a proof system that calculational proof procedure is complete. In the sense, if it is semantically valid, you will be able to show that it is valid. Okay? So, these are some of the types of questions we will be concerned with always in logic. So, always we are looking from above, something happens here, how does it happen, whether it is guaranteed to happen or not and so on. These type of things we will be doing. So, now let us see for this, what happens here. There are in fact two questions, only one question I told you. The other question is suppose in the calculation sigma union not w you have derived bottom, fine. What is the guarantee that sigma union not w is unsatisfiable? That is an easy question. See, I have I have done calculations, right. In the calculation, I have found that sigma union not w enters bottom. Why is it that sigma union not w is unsatisfiable? Why?
see you can answer fine do not go to the answer understand the problem I want you to think about the problem it is a valid question right do you see see the laws we have derived from semantics that is why we have the faith suppose I have not derived those laws by semantics I just give the laws out of the blue I say that follow these laws from sigma n naught w and tells bottom by following the laws only right what is the guarantee that semantically it will be correct need not hmm? do you see the problem suppose I give a law a plus b whole square equal to a q plus b square plus 2 a b right now I ask you that you do whatever calculation you do with this what is the guarantee that you will be reaching the correct conclusion may not be ok. So, this is so because we know a plus b whole square is not that, but a square plus b square plus 2 a b right. If you use that law always you will get the correct result right, but as a question it is a valid question that we have to see slowly. So, that is called the soundness of calculation that whatever you are doing with calculation is not wrong, it is sound, it is correct that is one part. The other part is completeness that whatever you deduce or you do semantically so that some consequence is correct semantically it can be validated by a calculation that is the completeness of the calculational procedure right. So, here one part is easy to see soundness part because we are using only the laws which are done by se semantics right then you do induction on the number of calculational steps because only one step is justified by a law. So, if you go on doing you need induction there right for going from many steps finite steps it does not matter every step is justified therefore, total is justified that is the argument, but formally you need induction there for n steps if it is valid n plus 1 step you are going that step is valid because of a law which is semantically correct therefore, n plus 1 steps it is valid by induction proof is over is that ok. So, let us state it formally it says adequacy of calculation. So, suppose sigma is a finite set of propositions W a proposition that sigma b. Huh? Now, we say that sigma entails W if and only if there is a calculation showing sigma entails W. So, adequacy takes care of both the parts soundness and completeness. So, now there is a calculation showing sigma entails w, then sigma entails w is the soundness of calculation right this if this ok and the completeness is sigma entails w then there is a calculation ok. So, how do we prove this soundness anyway we have given the way how to prove it let us try for the completeness that always you can do it. So, now in the completeness your assumption is suppose sigma entails w there we will start we have to show that there exists a calculation which shows that sigma entails w ok fine. Now, sigma is a finite set. So, write sigma equal to say w 1 to w n these are the propositions ok. Now, then sigma entails w can be written as written as huh? I want to write it as one proposition. So, I would write this way ok, this is valid is that clear. So, this is valid means 
I may say this is equivalent to top. You can use equivalence or you can use entailment also, top employer entails this, any one of the forms. But let us say equivalent to top, that will be easier to see here. Now, our problem is to show that if this is equivalent to top, then there is a calculation in showing that this is equivalent to top. In a calculation, we have to show it, that is what it asks for. Is that clear? Hmm? So, how do we proceed? Yes. Okay. It will ask you to do for bottom instead of top. Now, let us go for top itself, does not matter. So, what we do is we take this as a single proposition now. It is a single proposition. Now, convert this to CNF. From a CNF, you can determine exactly whether it is top or not, whether it is valid or not, can be determined. Yes? What is the procedure to determine? You have a CNF. When can you say it is valid? Every class has, uh, Every class has a pair of complementary literals that can be checked. Right? So, what is the meaning of that? Which law will tell you? every class you find a pair of complementary literals therefore, it is equivalent to top. Is there a law like that? Yes, excluded middle P or not P is there. So, that becomes equivalent to top and then top or anything else will become also top. So, you need associativity go on combining with all those with top everything else. So, finally, it will become top right and P can be somewhere, not P can be somewhere else. So, you have to bring them together in order that you apply excluded middle. right? So, you need commutativity. So, commutativity associativity of R, right? then law of constants top or x equivalent to top. right? So, laws of constants you will need. Basically, it is laws of constant associativity, commutativity, excluded middle. Is that okay? So, these four laws tell us how to check whether there is a pair of complementary literals and why that becomes equivalent to top. Okay? These are the four laws. Before that, you need a CNF conversion. So, what are the laws you need for CNF conversion? Distributivity, De Morgan, elimination of implies and biconditional, right? Then double negation these are the laws you need. So, then if you have all these laws, you can prove it by calculation, it is equivalent to top. Okay? So, what is our algorithm? First convert that to a CNF using all those laws. Then after you get the CNF, use associativity, commutativity, excluded middle, law of constants that brings it to equivalent to top. That is all, that is the end of the proof. Okay? Hmm? So, what we do? Now, conversion of W 1 and W 2 and W 1 implies W to a CNF uses the laws of implication by conditional double negation then de morgan and distributivity okay then checking so, all these are CNF conversion is preserving equivalence. So, there is a calculation to show that this statement is equivalent to another which is U which is in CNF. Is that okay? So, we start with this proposition goes on applying these laws to bring it to a CNF which is U let us say. 
Okay. So, there is a calculation here. Now, after this conversion you have u from u we are doing something. right? So, next checking for a complementary literal or a pair of complementary literal amounts to bringing equivalently the CNF to top by using which loss associativity commutativity of R then excluded middle and the laws of constants. Okay. This is again a calculation. Bringing the CNF equivalent to top okay so that means if you have only these laws always you can have a calculation to show that sigma and delta w is that clear other laws can be used for simplification to make it simpler but here is a procedure which uses only these laws and brings it to top that is guaranteed now. Is that clear? Okay. So, let us make over this uh, digression. Hmm. We can show that calculational method is complete and it is sound using the again CNF DNF conversion that is what we have done. It always need not be like that there are other ways of proving it, but you need to get matured huh, by for doing something other way. Okay, let us look at our SAT again, we go back to our SAT problem and see how it can be, uh, how the general SAT problem can be tackled that was our aim. Okay. Some particular cases we have seen 1 SAT, 2 SAT and the Horn formulas. Now, how to come to the general SAT problem or make some progress towards that. We know till now nothing has happened, not much progress in the worst case, but then the worst cases vary depending on the methods. It is not the same case which is worst case for all the methods. right? So, sometimes one worst case is for a method that same case can be best case for another method. So, if you have many methods to solve SAT probably it can help right? that is the idea. So, let us see one at least. So, this method which is called the method of resolutions basis on a very simple observation. You look at your law of hypothetical syllogism. It says that if you have two premises p implies q, q implies r then you can infer from it p implies r. Okay. Fine. This is a law again, hypothetical syllogism. Modus ponens is a particular case of this, you can see that also. Suppose you have only p implies q and p, then you infer q from it, that is your modus ponens. Okay. Let us look at this. If you write it in class form, it looks like not p or q, that is one class, another is not q or r from which you are concluding not p or r. Okay. Now, look at modus ponens, it says p, p implies q therefore, q. Now, write it in class form, it looks p 
not p or q, then you conclude q. Can you see what is being done looking at the causal forms, not at the original laws? I have p, I have not p or q, so I come to q. Just look at them formally, do not look at interpretations or models. Just take them formally, what is happening? P, not P or Q, Q. Now, here what is happening? Not P or Q, not Q or R, not P or R. There is something common between these two. What is happening? In one, there is Q, in the other, there is not Q. I just omit them, put them together, whatever remains, blindly, right. Here what happens? In one there is P, in another there is not P. I omit them, put them together, I get Q. Right? In general, how do I write it? Suppose I two similar things. Say I have P or some L1 or L2 or LK. And another there is not P or M1 or M2 or M R. Now, from this I would like to get L1 or L2 or LK or M1 or M2 or M R. Okay, if I look at those two and generalize it looks something like this. Resolution method does just this. It has only one rule, it is this rule. Then go on applying it in the clauses. That is called the resolution method, hmm? to put it simply. But then to make it formal, we have to do something more. Even to write it formally will take some time. Right? So, what we will do is we will write each clause under CNF in a set notation, so that it will be easy to put them. Because we want to say that omit P from this, omit not P from this, whatever remains put them together. Okay? So, if you have a set here, I say this set minus P, this set minus not P, take their union, right? so it will be easier to express. So, that means a clause, I have to write it as a set now, it is a set of literals. Right? And all our clauses here are disjunctive clauses. So, there should not be any confusion when I say set of laterals. It is a disjunction of the laterals. Is that okay? So, instead of writing them as ors, let us write that as set. Think of them as set. Again, we will be using dually, both the things we will be using. Do not forget one and take to the other. It is just a notation to write it in a better way. So, I say a disjunctive class. is taken as a set of literals. Okay. Now, what about a CNF? It is a conjunction of disjunctive clauses. Okay. So, I say a CNF is a set of clauses or disjunctive clauses. So, that means a CNF will look like a set of sets of laterals. Okay. Is that clear? Now, there will be one confusion here confusion about the empty set because empty set is unique, whether it is a set of sets or sets only, it does not distinguish. Fine. So, now empty set taken as a clause will mean what? That is our question. Hmm? So, question is about empty set as a clause is what? What should we fill in there? For a disjunctive clause, I am asking. Take that stop. Disjunctive clause. Huh? Bottom? It has to be top or bottom. Huh? Well, let us take two disjunctive clauses. Huh? Suppose A 
and B are two disjunctive clauses. Now, suppose A is a subset of B. Now, see I am using the dual notation, huh? taking that as a set also, taking that as a class also. Fine? Suppose A is a subset of B. Now, what is the relation between A and B for entailment? A entails B or B entails A? Huh? Well, take an example. Say A is P or Q, B is P or Q or R, right? A is a subset of B. So which one entails what? A entails B. P entails P or Q. P or Q entails P or Q or R, right? Or is weaker? Is that okay? You are in this class now, so your friend says. Either C is in the class or C is in the library. Correct, right? You are here. So that entails P entails P or Q. Is that clear? You are coming back to the entailment relation. Huh? Whether this is true? Take any interpretation where P is one. So, in the same interpretation P or Q is 1, therefore P enters P or Q. Okay. So, A really is a subset of B, then we see that A enters B. Okay. Fine. This is clear. This side is clear if it is a disjunctive class. We are telling about disjunctive classes only. So, as a set, if A is a taken as a subset of B, then A will enter B. Now, what about the empty set? Empty set is a subset of every set. So, empty set should enter everything. What is that which enters everything? Huh? Bottom. From a contradiction, everything follows. <laughs> right? There is a nice story about that. From a contradiction, everything follows. It is not a story; it's a fact. Huh? Uh, see, uh, Turing was a student in Wittgenstein's class. So Wittgenstein was giving a lecture on foundations of mathematics. That same Alan Turing, he was a student. So he used to take classes in a different way. Wittgenstein. He just sits on the table from the beginning to the end and teaches like a quack. Huh? So, they go on thinking, not, no, there is no teaching really. So, he once asked that suppose tomorrow someone finds out that there is a contradiction in the complex number system, what will happen? So, Turing immediately raised his hand and told that London Bridge will fall down. So, he was asked to explain, he told from a contradiction everything follows. <laughs> so, that is the story. So, what will happen to empty set? Okay. So, what should we take for the empty set? Empty set should entail everything. So, what is that which entails everything? Bottom. Because in that everything you can take bottom as well. right? Everything is there. So, you take bottom there. What entails bottom? Only bottom enters bottom, nothing else. That is the simpler proof. Right? So, this has to be bottom, nothing else. So, empty set is taken as bottom. So, this is when it is as a clause, right? as a disjunctive clause, we come to this. But if you consider this as a CNF, then what happens? Right? So, empty set as a CNF is what? There is nothing in it, right. So, again let us go back to set of 
clutches. Suppose C and D, C is a subset of D, both are C and F. Okay. So, it would look something like C 1 and C 2 and D will be something like C 1 and C 2 and D 1. Right? It is a set, same set. So, same elements are there, C 1 is there, C 2 is there, they are sets, but they are elements of C and D. So, it will look like there is some more class there. Right? So, now you see it is on the other side that we find D enters C. Okay. So, when you take the empty set, it will mean everything should enter the empty set. <coughs> so, let us call it empty set of sets, huh? empty C and F. So, it has to be top only, anything should enter that, what is that? You take on the left side top itself, top enters what? Okay. So, whatever that comes from a valid sentence should be valid. So, the only thing is top. Hmm. Uh, here you are actually taking phi as a part of a class and phi as a part of a CNF not phi as a CNF or phi as a class. No, no, phi as a CNF. It is the empty set of classes. There is no class in it. Of course, we will not get it anywhere, but just to go on notation all right, we have to fix some value to that. Right? So, empty set of clutches, there are clutches in it, but there is nothing. Okay? It is the empty set of clutches. <coughs> Similarly, here it is empty as a clutch, so it is empty set of literals, empty set viewed as a clutch. That is the meaning here. If you add anything with it, it is no more a class. Right? Sir, for example, if phi is contained in the CNF set, it is a disjunctive hmm. Suppose phi is contained in a CNF. So, how the CNF will look like? The CNF will look right? empty set, right? then some P or Q. Hmm. So, what will happen? So, this will always be yeah. unsatisfiable. Yes. Suppose I take a CNF which is like something like this. Now, this is always unsatisfiable, right? Is that clear? But this CNF is not equal to P or Q, it is there, empty set is there. It is an element of it. If you omit it, it is not the same. Right? Empty set as an element here. When you take union of this with empty set, you would see that empty set as a CNF. That is this. Okay? Is it clear? See, do not confuse with this and this. Right? It is a single turn whose element is empty set. It is an empty set. Is that clear? Okay. So, we will again uh, deliberate on this how to go for this set notation and then come to the resolution principle in the next class probably. So, we have done only horn clutches and adequacy of calculations. Then we are face to face with the resolution principle which requires some deliberation about the empty sets huh? as empty clutches or as empty CNFs. So, you see that empty clutches that is empty set viewed as a disjunctive class is same thing as bottom, whereas empty set viewed as a CNF as a set of disjunctive clutches is top.